And greetings. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Steve Dace Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I am Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He's Aaron McIntyre. We'll be joined here later or soon uh, by our good friend, New York talk show host, Shannon Joy, for the Dace Group. Uh, Of course, the show brought to you each day by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company, uh, the Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company that makes a flavor for every freedom-loving American and... They support your values while making some hella coffee as well. Uh, Shipped within days of being roasted, and they put the roast on date right there on the bag, just so you can verify that. Go to firstcup.com, use the code DACE, save an additional 10% on your order if you do. Firstcup.com, promo code DACE to save an additional 10% on your order. And if you subscribe, you'll save an additional 10% for the life of your subscription. Firstcup.com, promo code DACE. Want to let you know that it is likely at some point here during this program and maybe early on that we are going to break into our normal programming here with the Dace Group to talk on site uh, with our friend and colleague Steve Baker, uh, who was uh, ordered by the feds to surrender this morning in Dallas for essentially the charges of doing his job. And Uh, He's wrapping things up as we speak. He could be out any minute, but, you know, we're on the federal government's time. So any minute could be a minute or two. All right. But um, we wanted to alert you and, of course, our guest Shannon to that um, because uh, that will take priority given the gravity of the moment. So with that, it is time for the day script. There she is. Shannon, welcome aboard. Your weekly look at the week that was gets underway, otherwise known as the Dace Group, as it always does with issue one. Bleep, Lord Nefarious says. Parts of speech six. Zem, Zers, Zemself. Chris. What are pronouns? Those are pronouns. Neo pronouns. And all of this is happening with this infectious idea that's taking over of this idea of parents' rights, that parents have a right to know. They have a right to know if their child is going by a different name or using different pronouns in school. And the thing that keeps hitting me about this is that parents don't have rights, not parents' rights. Kids have rights. Sorry, excuse us. How old is she? Um, they are 15 months old. We actually use they, them pronouns for gray until they oh. tell us who they are. That's why you were like, who, what? Oh, oh wow. Okay. The debate about our people is killing us. Thank you for your testimony. Please stop killing us. If we turn away from Ukraine over the next decade and several decades, the American people and America will pay the price. Basically, the Republicans have become synonymous for Russians at this point. ¿Quién es mejor para el inmigrante ilegal? Uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. ¿Cuál es mejor, Trump or Joe Biden? John Biden, de igual manera. Joe Biden. Trump or Joe Biden? Eh, John Biden. Joe, Trump or Joe Biden? John Biden. Joe Biden. Trump or Joe Biden? Es el Joe Biden. Joe Biden. I think when a horrible tragedy like like this happens, I think whenever we're dealing um, with violent crime, there is a sense of outrage, of sadness, and of loss. But I think the important thing to focus on is any one instance shouldn't shape our overall immigration policy. In the main, I caution against conflating immigration and crime. The data demonstrates that the two are not connected. Have um, under the federal work study program now allow students to get paid through federal work study to register people um, and to be nonpartisan poll workers. As we know, this is important for a number of reasons. One, to engage our young leaders in this process and, and activate them. What do you would you want to do? What's your 2024 agenda? Because I feel like we live in such crazy times that that is one of the things I feel we hear less about. Look, the 2020 agenda is to finish the job. We know. Let's get to the first question. Shannon, as the guest, and ladies, always go first. What almost made you throw up in your mouth that you just saw and why 
It had to be the TikToker talking about the abolition of parental rights, which is really, at the end of the day, the big agenda. Uh, and it's also the beginning of the end of human rights. I have said for quite some time that the issue of vaccines is the defining issue of the 21st century because it involves the government seizure of your body, force mandated coercion to be, inject, or to be uh, injected or or manhandled by federal or you know health officials and you know here in new york state it, it's real like they we are looking right now at a bill a6761 in new york state that is going to completely obliterate parental rights gives the government of new york bureaucrats and even practitioners so no judge no jury no family court uh, no due process but a practitioner in a government institution pr probably a public school will have the right to conduct any type of medical procedure on any child at any time without parental knowledge or or consent. So this is a this is an assembly bill. It has a companion in the Senate and these Democrats who are pushing it are doubling and tripling down on it and it's going to be it's going to be uh, introduced in the next session. So this uh, completely obliterates parental rights and for anyone who thinks that this can't happen in a red state, so goes New York and California, so goes the rest of the country. It's why Texas is almost blue. So this is something that is that is incredibly important that all Americans rally again to, against to actually to completely crush because that's what they're going after they're going after the children and they want to seize them and and after that it's it's uh, no holds barred they'll go after everyone Aaron man there was a lot to pick from in in that particular case but let's go to the very very top I decided to start to, to start that cold a an institution of education and game show jeopardy now being helmed by one of the most successful jeopardy champions of all time i remember watching ken jennings just amazed in awe of that guy's just power of reciting and memorizing just useless seemingly information but it was legitimate information real information real facts of history of science of theology even, that he was able to just spring to life from the depths of his brain at any given moment. Now, 20 years later, neo-pronouns. Neo-pronouns. Those are neo-pronouns. Mm. Uh, it, is, it is the dumbing down of everything, of every facet of our discourse on purpose. Yikes. Todd. Uh, representative, what, Katie Porter? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that gaslighting, you know, don't let any one issue when That's all they do. They take any one issue, real or imagined, usually imagined, and bludgeon you with it. And we usually cave in. This is the whole, that's what Lib TikTok is famous for, just pointing out the one issues that you tried to make us swallow with your, in your own little silo or whoever you wanted to advertise to. They said, hey, let us help you and show you what, you, what you're doing and what you're saying. And we actually gave you a bigger megaphone because we wanted to say, maybe you need to know what's going on. And now you have to go after Libs of TikTok for how dare you do it, because that's all you do. It's all about taking one issue and propagandizing it and gaslighting it to the ends of the earth. And for Katie Porter to say what she said in the face of there is now video, that entire UGA campus is filled with people that went to a candlelight vigil to honor the fallen there. But no, that that's going to be shoved, a hole is going to be shoveled and that's going to be put in. But Tomorrow, we're going to find out the one issue that people like Katie Porter really care about, and it's going to be a nothing burger, or she's actually going to be supporting the equivalent of the demon in the Capitol, and all hell's going to break loose for Katie Porter. That's the game. Yet we keep losing it. Mm. One of the major reasons we keep losing it is because... The Republican Party is like the COVID jab, by and large. Yeah. Whatever short-term benefit you think you are getting by taking that shot, the long-term ramifications of taking it far outweigh any of those benefits. 
Not to mention, they are the very definition of short term, so you have to keep taking it. But then once you start taking it, your immune system becomes so compromised and they, and they tell you, they gaslight you and tell you it's not the shot you keep taking. It's long COVID, which makes you then think I got to keep taking that shot. The best which analogy then, you've ever made on the show. Magic R, magical yeah. power of yes. vaccines. That's, which that's which so means, <laughs> which means I need to keep taking the shot yeah. because my immune system, it can't fight off like any, anything now. I, I, I mean, you see people say I've had COVID for the sixth, seventh time. They're always jabbed every single time, hundred percent, every time. And yet you can't consider the long-term ramifications of, of your association with this shot because the short-term consequences are so are such a fixation and you're being gaslit about the source of what those short-term consequences are that you've got to deal with this right now in the immediate so you go back for another booster. This has been our relationship with the Republican Party. And I'd say this is someone I've... I've allowed this to, I've, I've, I've even been a part of this. I've allowed this to happen to yeah, me. Yeah, we all have. Okay. But yeah, that we can't, you know, and now I, I kind of actually think we are at the election that maybe, I mean, we cannot afford to lose. Okay. Um, after we've been told this for the last, how many, 25 years. And now it does seem to me like we might be at a point of no return. But, but understand if you're watching what's happening on Capitol Hill right now. Katie Porter has no opposition. There, there is no organized opposition to Katie Porter. None. None. Instead, it's a competition to see who can send the most money to Ukraine. Correct. What, mm. the, the, the so-called opposition to Katie Porter is a COVID shot. It is... Um, w- Joe Biden can effectively shut down the sovereignty of the country by letting over 7 million illegal aliens into this country in the last three years. Over 7 million. More than the population of 36 states. How many people in that 7 million are drug mules, human traffickers, suicide by fentanyl merchants, criminals, rapists, murderers? How many? Let's say it's 1%. You know what 1% of 7.6 million is? Let's say 99% are people that just are escaping squalor to come and find the American Mm -hmm. dream. It's not 99%, but let's just say that it is. Let's say it's only 1% are the people I just described. You know how many people that would be? 76,000 people is how many people that would be. 76,000 people. That is about Donald Trump's total margin of victory in swing states in 2016. That is more than Joe Biden's total margin of victory in swing states in 2020. Stop and think about that for just a minute. It's also 75,980 more people than it took to pull off 9-11. Stop and think about that. And yet... We can't, we can't even use a government shutdown as leverage against this, let alone the willingness to go through with it, because Ukraine must be funded and Jack Smith's antifada against Donald Trump must be funded. So we're going to fund assassinations. We're going to let the Democrats just use the lawfare to essentially proverbially assassinate their political opposition. And uh, keep the government going that has handed our sovereignty over to drug cartels and who got God knows who else at the southern border. Because a handful of guys are convinced that uh, their pensions might be on the line. If we shut down the government, they might lose their elections. They're more important than you. Frankly, Donald Trump's not even asking them to defund Jack Smith, which just blows my mind. I, that, that just that, that absolutely blows my mind. Donald Trump's not even saying defund this. Don't let him do this. He's not, he's not even saying it. But here's the thing. And this is again the trap. If we let these other people win, more people are going to go to jail like Catherine Herridge and our colleague Steve Baker are doing today like pro-life protesters did. These these are tangible, real-world results we cannot ignore. Can we ignore this? No. 
as, as, as I've got 57 problems with Donald Trump. Would his Department of Justice have our colleague Steve Baker doing a perp walk today? Hope not. Probably not. And so we will all rush out. It probably won't matter anyway. They probably won't win because the Democrats have a, it appears to be an impenetrable uh, <clears throat> turnout operation, we'll call it. So we'll, we, we will hold our noses, mask up politically. We and, shouldn't. And do it all over again. And it won't work Not anyway. Right. It probably won't work anyway. Okay? It won't work. But, but, but we feel like we have to because we can't afford the short-term consequences of this infection. So we'll just take yeah. another booster. We'll take another GOP booster. Take another one. Trump's not going to help anyone. I, I don't know why anyone th- would think that Trump would do anything. Trump had the opportunity to pardon J6 prisoners, and he never did it. Trump did not lift a finger for J6 prisoners. Trump did nothing for them after they were arrested on his behalf at Capitol Hill. So to think that he would do anything is crazy. In yeah, my I opinion. agree. I tend it's to agree with joke. you. The That's argument the, the argument against that is, well, now that he's in the crosshairs, you know, BS. Uh, yeah, but BS. I, 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 th- this gathered. whole thing, th- 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 this whole thing is, a, is an irrelevant argument anyway, because it probably none of this will matter 249 days from now because There's of a lot their you can do in 249 days besides obsessing over Trump. There's a lot conservative media could do over the next. They could. Over the next they, they won't. Days they won't to really make changes yeah, rather but, than letting him drive everything, the agenda, the conversation, everything. Sorry, I'm just saying. No. Yeah, well, I've said it many times myself, but it yeah. it won't happen. So we're just. Well, they should start. You're they urinating start. into wind, but I, well, I'm did, feeling you. They see the, the writing right up on uh, right wing news re- media platforms. They they better understand in in the bigger platforms, Fox News, you know, Daily Wire. That they are completely separated from the American people right now. They are talking about nothing that is important to the American people. There was an incredibly important hearing that happened after CPAC on Monday of this week that no one covered, no one cared about. And they didn't cover medical freedom at CPAC because Donald Trump is the nominee and the leader of the party. And you cannot talk about 1.5 million injured people from the COVID vaccines. Can't talk about V-safe data. Can't talk about anything that matters to the American people in conservative media because Trump dominates everything because they think that they're going to get money from this. That somehow he's going to deliver for them and sell the sneakers and sell the shoes and all of that BS. And that's why people aren't going back because they're not talking about the things people want to hear about anymore. They're talking about Trump ad nauseum and he's betrayed us. And, and them over and over and over. I can't believe we're still giving this guy oxygen. I'm sorry. It's a joke. Exit question. We're up against the clock. Exit question. On a scale of one to 10, with one being the effort made the last four years to counter the Democrats' ballot harvesting operation. 10 being the amount of complaining and grifting that will be done about it after the November election 249 days from now. Rank this week's level of total depravity, Aaron. 20. Just Shannon. Because, not because of what was in the montage, but because of the scale. Because of the scale. Shannon? 50. <laughs> Todd? I'm at a 50 today. <laughs> Just keep going. Higher. Higher. You want me at 100? <laughs> you don't want me at 100. <laughs> Before we get to issue two, let, let's talk about uh, something that does make a difference, and that's the partnership we have with our partners over at Preborn. It has literally... Uh, saved with your help and your kindness and your generosity, tens of thousands of babies. I mean, preborn over the years in the history of their ministry has saved hundreds of thousands of babies uh, because they practice both truth and grace. They they do what most churches today claim to do, but don't. Uh, they just do the uh, the grace, which isn't grace because without truth, it's just affirmation. They do them both. They confront moms who are considering uh, murdering their children. And they confront them with the ultrasound so they hear that heartbeat uh, so that in, in, in the hopes that their conscience is pricked that they will not go through with it. The majority of the time it works. And those ultrasounds, even with Biden inflation, still cost less than 30 bucks. I mean, what would be a better expenditure of 30 bucks for you today, barring an immediate family need, than the opportunity to save one of these children made in the likeness and image of God. Not to mention to save the moms from making a mistake that they will regret, will stain their souls. So you're saving them both. 
and they care for these moms too, both uh, pre-delivery and then afterwards. They don't want to just leave it at thank you for choosing life. They they know it's hard. Most women that are thinking con- and considering an abortion are doing so not because they're in a safe and secure relationship, but because they're not. So if you want to donate today, dial pound 250, say the keyword baby on your mobile phone, pound 250, keyword baby on your mobile phone, or go to preborn.com slash Steve. That's preborn.com slash Steve. Let's get to issue two. Ditch's final glitch. This is Mitch McConnell then. This is Mitch McConnell now. This is Mitch McConnell with a cow. This is Mitch McConnell taking a bow. If you would have told me 40 years later that I would stand before you as the longest serving Senate leader in American history, frankly, I would have thought you'd lost your mind. But now it's 2024. I'm now 82. McConnell was a master political operator, an exceptional statesman, and a hardline ideologue on numerous issues. It's just unfortunate none of that was on behalf of his constituents. Oh, and his term isn't up until 2027. Actually, I'm, I'm thankful now for Shannon's rant that went over time in that segment because it left less time for this topic. Okay, I, I felt when I came up with the rundown, it should be addressed. This is arguably the, the most influential figure on the American right since Reagan. And oh my gosh, I just said that out loud and I really just want to quit my job. I, I mean, that's probably true. I didn't even consider this as I was just, you know, riffing here. But why? I don't even know what to say I to do. that. I do. I, I don't even know what to say that that is actually true. He is the most influential political figure, at least in terms of office holder. I guess if you wanted to say overall figure, you'd say probably Rush. But if we're talking people that have held elected office... My word, I just, I mean, I'm reconsidering life choices. Forgive me, I'm, I just triggered myself. Someone else talk. I don't, I don't even know where the rundown is. I'm oh, lost. To the Holy degree- crap, I'm, I'm just, I'm taking a COVID booster after saying that. Holy crap. <laughs> to the degree that he's a master of anything, it's only possible because of who he's surrounded by. It's just qu- quizzlings, gifter, grifters, cowards. That's why. It wasn't like he was, he, he ended up uh, winning a game of King of the Mountain against the best of the best. It's just, he's surrounded by just awful, awful people. Look at, just on this f- four square that was just up on the screen before, there, Shannon and I, as, as a journalist, and in the time it happened, I guess you were kind of a journalist parent hybrid. The both yep. of us have actually been frog marched like our colleague Steve Baker before. We've, had, right. we've been handcuffed just right. by doing basic pushback, which is far more than Mitch McConnell has ever had to face in That's that right. place. That's the difference. He's not really that good or that clever. He's just surrounded by pathetic people. That's why. Well, and he has a dark, dark, black, black, callous heart. And he's he's the embodiment of everything that is Washington, D.C. and the two-party political system and the people in media who prop them up and cover for them. It's soulless. It's callous. It's a carcass of an institution. And they're just there to take the money. It's it, He holds the purse strings. That's it. He controls the levers of power, and they just hand the money off to their cronies and their partners. They've done it over and over and over, elevating people who should never be elevated. So in my people analogy, you're smart. basically saying that McConnell is Pfizer. Yeah. In my yeah. analogy, McConnell's Pfizer, essentially, and buying off the regulatory, the captured regulatory yeah. agencies that aren't doing their jobs, that are essentially extensions of his agenda. Drop that. Yeah, like, he knows all the players. It. He holds the purse strings. He can get the, you know, everything slipped in the bills, make the deals happen, and they keep this disgusting machine churning over and over and over. And, and it will not stop. Unfortunately, conservative media used to do a great job of exposing this stuff and pre- pre- presenting some kind of pushback, but somehow we've all been kind of wrapped into it. And now it's a monster. It's just a Leviathan because they get away with it over and over and over. Why can I, don't know how can I report to the courthouse? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, Why can I, Pfizer get away with it, Steve, though? Because of what you said. Every, oh, 
Give me another shot. Give me that booster. Give me right. that jab. That right. baby right in front of right. me needs 70 of them. Poke them, poke them, poke them, poke them. It's the same right. thing. You're exactly right. Aaron, the, my favorite take this week was we wouldn't have overturned Roe without McConnell. As if it was, it, it, as if, if, if we had a, a Republican Senate leader. Yeah, if Ted Cruz did, was a Senate leader, we wouldn't have overturned right, Roe right. v. Wade. Yeah, like, like, the guy that wouldn't, like the guy that wouldn't have betrayed us on everything else, like McConnell did, wouldn't have also delivered justices that overturned Roe. Like, like that was the payoff. We had, to, we had to let McConnell betray the country on everything else so that he would not allow Barack Obama to appoint Antonin Scalia's successor, which I absolutely believe was only done because that would have blown the entire cover for why most people vote Republican still for good judges. Mm. In the 2016 election, if, if, if McConnell would have allowed Obama to appoint Scalia's successor, that would have blown, that, that idol would have been smashed. He had to keep, that was the, that's the core of their grift, all right? That's how they keep the people in line. You want better judges, don't you? Fed, the federal courts is where policy is made. We can't let the other side win. I tell you right now, if we would have, we, the same kind of majority leader or Republican leader that wouldn't have betrayed us on everything else like McConnell would have would have delivered Roe v. Wade as well that is a false choice I reject it Aaron yeah if you had a running back in a football game who fumbled 10 times before scoring a touchdown at the end of the game is that running back good or bad there you go Um, he's bad he's still bad so yeah that's just a false a completely false choice Uh, I have a question the Senate Leadership Fund that is the super PAC that is uh, basically uh, tasked with uh, maintaining a Republican majority in the United States Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, at last I knew, Mitch McConnell's former chief of staff was running that outfit. Uh, any changes in leadership there? Have you heard of any changes in no. leadership there? So, no. Uh, no. Mitch McConnell is dead. Long live Mitch McConnell. Uh, that's- Shannon, I'll, I know you're chomping yeah. at the bit. You've got one minute. Go. Yeah. Who needs abortion anymore when they can essentially abort full grown humans and sterilize an entire population of Americans through their forced and coerced COVID-19 jabs, right? So abortion isn't even, you know, they've completely abandoned that issue. They don't even need Planned Parenthood clinics anymore because if they can't have the right to force inject in perpetuity without liability and get rich doing it, they can do whatever they want to our bodies. That's, that's how far this has gone out of our control to make the the pro-life movement, frankly, somewhat irrelevant because they can do this anytime. Well, you didn't even mention the chemical abortion angle to this that they have pursued in the post-Dobbs world as well, but your point stands for sure. Exit question. If you were given the opportunity, sincerely, to pick one current senator to take McConnell's place come January, whom would it be and why? Todd. In leadership. Yeah. Grand Paul. Yeah. I think Grand Paul. So you'd stay in the state or the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Why? Yeah, well, that part, they don't deserve that. Uh, well, because on uh, several issues. I mean, I we, like your choice. I just want to let you explain it. Particularly the one that you have rightly twice analogized this entire party to. He has shown an appetite for going after. Yeah, I've said multiple times that there's no other, I mean, beyond Ted Cruz, beyond even Ron DeSantis, beyond Donald Trump, there's no one who I see uh, possessing a visceral and personal disdain for Democrats, the right Democrats, than Rand Paul. And they hate him back, and they've nearly taken his life multiple times. Shannon, if you could pick, who would it be? Ron Johnson, bar none, 100%. Those are both very good choices. Those are both very good choices. Your guys' rationale for Rand Paul, I think, is good. I mean, Shannon's the rationale for Ron Johnson, I'm sure, is that he's really, he's the one that has been willing to go. I mean, Rand's been good going after Fauci, but Ron is the mm. one that's really been good to go after the the uh, big pharma industrial complex. I guess, right? Is that yeah. your rationale? Yeah, he's giving a very very important platform, an yeah. incredibly important platform to some of the most brilliant scientists and doctors and Correct. researchers. Ron Johnson's the only politician in America that told me that allowed a platform to emerge that told me things about the last few years that I previously did not know on my own. He's the only one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And if you watch that hearing this past week, which I recommend everyone does, it's four hours of testimony. You can see how well Ron Johnson knows this issue Mm -hmm. of medical freedom, informed consent, the vaccine. His questions were brilliant. All right. We'll come back. We'll see if uh, our colleague Steve Baker has been uh, released yet. Otherwise, we'll continue on uh, with the day's group here in a moment.
All right, back here on the Steve Day Show, we are told that the release of our colleague and friend Steve Baker uh, is imminent. Again, that could be in the next five minutes. That could be sometime next hour. Uh, so we'll continue on as normal until uh, he uh, leaves and approaches the camera so we can talk to him about his ordeal and uh, what's happening to him and uh, to a lot larger degree what's happening in our country today. Uh, first, let me tell you about our friends over at Real Estate Agents I Trust. Um, I, I absolutely believe there's going to be a boom in the housing market here in the spring and summer. If for no other reason, then they... Um, uh, <laughs> People just can't sit on this glut of inventory forever. I mean, I've already seen a few yard. I've seen a few yard signs in my neighborhood already. I didn't really see any yard signs in my neighborhood last year. All right, so if if you're in that position where you put it off long enough and you're you were hoping that the interest rates would go down, things would get back to normal, but now you got to move. Make sure more than ever you go in with a real estate agent you can trust. You're going to find them at realestateagentsitrust.com. A lot of times, these agents that we select, um, after they've been vetted as top sellers in the area, people with long track records of success, a lot of times you're going to find, by the way, they are Blaze viewers and listeners just like you, so they share the exact same value system. Make sure you've got one of them at the ready. When you go to realestateagentsitrust.com, do not go into the housing market without one of these. realestateagentsitrust.com. We do not have Steve. We do have the shot set up, so uh, it's imminent whenever he gets out of the courthouse. All right. All right. So with that, we'll continue on. Uh, We'll welcome in uh, Shannon as we continue on with the day's group, understanding we could get interrupted here at some point. Let's go to issue three. Um, We can't outrun the old magic. New data from a survey from Brad Wilcox in the Institute for Family Studies shows women are happier in marriages where they gave their husbands high marks for masculinity. The State of Our Union survey showed that even in the year 2024, wives who gave their husbands top ratings for protectiveness were more likely to be happy in their marriages and less likely to report that divorce might be in their future. So first question, Todd, um, why are men and women so unhappy these days, despite our highest in world history standard of living? I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss and it's a mystery to me and I have no idea why this is the case. Maybe you could answer it for us. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is because we've been transgendered for quite some time. The, the actual, before we made it official? Yeah, before we, the, the physical manifestations, the the self-abuse, the cutting of body parts off, things like that. But before that, we really didn't know, in many respects, maritally, what a man or a woman was. And That's we were a great point. We were just, yep. we're, we're peers, and we kind of, we, in order to have kids, we kind of got to do this. But it's so much, it's so much more cosmic than that, and we just refused uh, to be uh, a, a part of that. We, and not only did we refuse to be a part of it, uh, we resented it on some level that's what i think the biggest reason is we tra- transgenderism is something that we are all on the hook for i think that we can't reset this point enough this is this is the this is the point of romans one yes there there can be directly incurred divine judgments but often the wrath of god is revealed upon a culture when the restraining hand of natural law common grace whatever you want to call it is removed so that we are now free to act on what was already occurring in our own depraved minds that's the what the scriptures refer to being as being given over that's what you're describing yeah. is that process that we entertained these notions spiritually and intellectually and philosophically for a few decades And then, okay, at that point when it was very clear that we were serious about flirting with disaster, Molly Hatchet, we we heard the whole, we got the whole album. At that point, that's not, that the cutting began after that, that the the cutting didn't lead to this, that these thoughts um, and, 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 and the blurring of these lines and these roles and the loss of these traditions is what led to the cutting we're seeing now. Exactly. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Shannon. I think I go back to Matthias Desmet when we, he tried to explain how we all went bonkers in 2020 and just did like the dumbest things in lockdown, shut down, covered our faces with filthy rags and then mass injected ourselves with poisons because government officials told us to do so. Uh, trying to understand that mass formation, the cult, the, um, the mob. And he talks about um, 
free floating and anxiety and an, an inability to place where that anxiety is coming from because nothing makes any sense. Like we're in this moment in time. I think it's the end moment of probably five or six decades of massive corruption and lies and acceptance of lie upon lie upon mm-hmm. lie that we're now at this bottom moment where the sky is green and the grass is blue. A man is a woman. A woman is a man. Um, there's no truth. There's nothing to cling to. There's nothing for people to to understand as to why they feel bad. And so they have a sense of this just general low level or even high level anxiety about everything. You don't know when the next shoe is going to drop. You know that everyone in power lies to you constantly. You know that nothing that the media is telling you is true. And so you're just desperately trying to grasp onto something. And for those of us who have faith and we have a biblical understanding, we've read the Bible cover to cover, there's something that that we can grab onto. But for those poor souls out there that just have no idea what's going on. It is a very troubling, a very unsettling time to live. I also think we're at war right now and people who don't understand that we are at war, it's a 21st century world war using not conventional weapons, but psychological weaponry and, and bio weapons and, um, you know, all of those, those new types of, of infiltrations and assaults on humans that people, you know, if you don't understand that and you're not waking up every morning on a war footing, like, okay, what are they going to throw at me today? And how am I going to battle that within my spirit and my soul? Then you're just not going to, you're, you're not going to be able to survive. So that's kind of the best I can, the, the best I can make of the situation we're in right now. People are so, so unhappy. That's well said. Aaron, you just can't fight nature. You can't fight. Yeah. You can't um, outrun the, the wind. You just cannot. The more, whether it's on a broad cultural psychosis level, like we have with the acceptance of so-called transgenderism, or whether it's on an intimate level, on a granular level, saying, I'm not going to live up to my role as a man and protect what God has told me to protect, or I don't even acknowledge God at all. Eventually, you are in that act, whether it's at the cultural level or the granular level, you are trying to fight nature. And I'm talking yeah. about the way God has designed us. The more you do that, the further you run from God, the further you're running from goodness and grace. And mm. so, of course, you're going to be unhappy. Of course, you're going to be unhappy. And what surveys like this, and that's what was underscored in this report. The year is 2024. And women, wives who report that their husbands or characterize their husbands as masculine and protective, what is the number one job of the husband, of the man in the home, the head of the household? It's to protect. That is a God-ordained role. They report what? In the year 2024, amidst all of the madness out there, they report that they are happier. As the title of the, the topic suggests, you cannot defeat the old magic. It's simple. Not easy, but it is simple. Let's get to the exit question. Well said, each of you. Each of us has children. Uh, What's the best in marriage advice that you would give them? Aaron, I'll go back to you to start. So, I I mean, I've been married and uh, the least amount of time of anybody here have the fewest amount of children of anybody here. But uh, as far as marriage advice goes, never, ever, ever, I would say, uh, lose. I, I'm enjoying this right now. I'm sure that there will be challenges in our marriage ahead. Every, every marriage goes through those challenges. But never, ever lose giving your spouse the benefit of the doubt any turn. Mm. That is the innocence of a new marriage. And I hope that we never, never lose that in our marriage. It makes things so much more easy. Um, you, see, uh, you see your spouse in a different light. Now, I hope there's not a <laughs> not a um, a challenge ahead where, you know, uh, something comes up that would that would cause either of us to not give each other the benefit of the doubt. But um, that that's that's just kind of uh, on par with, again, not losing the innocence of, of marriage. That's pretty good advice for being a for being a relative rookie here on the panel. Mm-hmm. Todd, you know, I 
this maybe it's obvious steve you said it in your own way uh recently in the last couple years but it has to be said uh your marital promise is first and foremost is to god that uh, don't lie to your kid yourself about that the the, the the romantic uh partnership is wonderful and you are absolutely making promises to each other but those promises are built on sand if you are not also making a promise to god of equal value that's good shannon Ooh. give you the last word on this I would say going into it, you really have to have tough conversations about your values and your principles and make sure that you share values. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be religious faith or your religious, maybe, maybe it does, but I just think that, um, a lot of people were torn apart in, over the past three years over, um, even the issue of vaccine and lockdown lockdowns. And so have those tough conversations and, um, laugh a lot and not take anything too seriously. That's one of the things that has kind of saved us through all of this. Um, my husband was very close to getting a vaccine and it was a really, really tough time in our marriage, especially with the kids as well. When, when one person feels really strongly and just, um, definitely giving it to God when those things fall apart give it all up to God and just beg him to save your marriage and and just laugh as much as you can and be silly and try not to take things too seriously. Well, in the vein of not taking things too seriously, let's get to our kicker topic, issue four. All right. Which of these politicians is most likely to have a child one day with a woman they are married to at that time? A, Tim Scott. B, Lindsey Graham. C, Cory Booker. <laughs> Or D, and my personal favorite choice, Nancy Mace. Can I go first? Yes. The only thing this timeline is missing is Nancy Mace coming out as bi, so I'm going out. I, I'm going with that. Yeah. I mean, we're, she's three seconds from the wet t-shirt contest. All right. So, yeah. Uh, Nancy Mace <laughs> is my personal favorite choice. Todd. I got to be honest. I, and I, she will be president one day if we last this long. But go ahead. As I get this list, like this is beneath you, Dace. Maybe you're losing your fastball. I'm just reading. Or it's one of the I, most prophetic things I've ever, ever actually put to together. Nancy, and then I got to Nancy Mason. And I'm like, it was dumber, dumber. You've totally redeemed yourself, man. <laughs> just perfection. Behold if There he is. Da, That's my guy. Da, da, <laughs> da, da, da. Yes. All right, Shannon, go ahead. Um, I like, I like, you took my, you took my choice, Nancy Mace, a hundred percent. I think it's Nancy Mace with a bullet. <laughs> Nancy Mace with a bullet. No question about it. Um, let's get to predictions. Aaron, you go first. None of my sports predictions were, will ever come true again. Last week I predicted Caitlin Clark would never go to the NBA and she, WNBA and she'd come back for her COVID season less than a week later. She's like, yeah, I'm going to go to the WNBA this summer. I think she's making a mistake and I hope I'm wrong. I think I think I just I'll just say it. I think a white girl from the Midwest going to that league the summer of of a of a, an election that will be as nasty as this one already is. I that that entire league is a political construct and make sure you quote me correctly on your Media Matters uh, newsletter that I'll be in this weekend for everything I'm saying right now, okay? That entire league there's no market for it. There's no demand for it. The entire thing is a is a socio-political construct. And it is largely a, it, it, it's largely one of woke rainbow jihad interests. I'll just say this, man, if it was my daughter, I, I mean, she's a woman now, a grown woman, a girl, do what she wants. But if it was my daughter, I'd strongly be counseling her. Stay in college as long as you can. You can absolutely break the bank with NIL. You're a beloved figure. You do not want to, you're, you're, you're going to be, oh my gosh, I, I can't even, I, my heart breaks as a dad. I mean, the first time she struggles in a game, she's going to be every ESPN talking head show. Uh, you know, she's only, she's not that great. She's white. Selfish. I, I mean, I, yes, I just, I mean, I just, as a dad, I saw that announcement last night. I forgot about it till you just mentioned it. And my heart sunk, frankly, as when I saw it. I think it's a terrible mistake. If I were her, I'd not be in any hurry at all to go play in that league, if ever. Todd. Uh, my favorite scene in Apollo 13, and there's a lot of them, is when, you know, the bleep has hit the fan already and they're talking about, you know, how to, to get this out to the press. And one guy just says, you know, this is going to be seen as the worst history, uh, the worst moment in the history of NASA. And Ed Harris's character comes in and he says, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. And I think 
that opportunity is here uh, for the Blaze. Incredibly uh, proud by, through Steve to be a part of this organization in this moment. And to Glenn, Tyler, Gaston, Matthew, I mean, swing away, man. Um, it, it, whatever you've all done in the past is for in this moment saying here and no further. We've got your back, Steve Baker, promise. Here's the thing people should know about things around here. It, we, it's pretty obvious we don't all agree on everything when we talk about issues or personalities, but we are all given the freedom to air our opinions. And there's not a lot of places, frankly, in a lot of platforms these days, particularly ones of magnitude like the blaze, where that is actually true. There just aren't. Right. And, and here's what you need to know about how they treated Steve Baker. They responded to the feds coming after him by giving him a full-time job. Yeah, I know. And having his back all the way. It was doubling down. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can't, you guys have no idea the amount of money this company has lost. Uh, lost out on from an opportunity cost by getting rid of ads on our website so we can put stuff from Steve Baker on there because if we did it before we were just getting bombed by Facebook and we were getting no revenue out of it so we just went peer to peer directly to consumer no one else still has done that I promise you soon they're all going to do it because there's no money to be made anywhere else um, with the current big tech environment but you know I, I I I just maybe those are a couple of things I think that needed to be said yeah. that people don't know that are kind of inside baseball. Yeah, Shannon, I'm sorry, we're short on time. I want to make sure you get your prediction and go ahead. Um, well, I guess I'm I'm still predicting that Haley Nikki Haley is going to be Trump's um, running mate, and I think that's going to happen. I know a lot of people don't think so, but I think it's going to be Nikki Haley. See, I'm glad you made that prediction because it's a total counter to mine. Tulsi yeah. Gabbard will be Trump's money running mate, and it will be announced by Memorial Day. Yeah, I mean... Tulsi Gabbard will be Trump's running mate. Uh, the most interesting to me and most important part of that is Memorial Day. Like The, the, conventions, sooner, in, the conventions in mid-July, they... Yeah. Sooner rather than later, give Pete... Listen, just for the sake of arguing strategy, you, yep. you need help, dude. You got to put something out there that make people talk about that you're serious, way more serious this time about something than you were last time. See, Shannon, I think the party owns them. I, oh, I think the party owns them, so they... Yeah. Would you, did I miss that? Would, well, I'm sorry. The party owns them. That's why it's going to be oh. uh, Nikki, which is yeah. an interesting point in and of itself. Except, yeah. you know, Nikki Haley's out there today filing court briefs yeah. saying a uh, rule on Trump's case is early, please. So, <laughs> Shannon, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a party this is. <laughs> Shannon, thank you. Appreciate you. God bless. All right. We'll try to connect with Steve Baker uh, when we come back or at some point in hour two. Stay tuned. And we're back here with Hour 2 live and on demand on Blaze TV radio and podcast alongside Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace and you are you and you can let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Just please email us to do so. Steve at SteveDace.com, D-E-A-C-E. You can also like us on Facebook. Find us there. Facebook, MeWe and Gab. You can uh, follow me at Steve Dace Show and interact there on uh, Twitter, Gitter, uh, Instagram and TikTok as well. If you're a podcast listener, we'd love it if you'd interact with your podcast platform by leaving us a five star review and we appreciate all of you that did that for us already hit subscribe or if you're on itunes follow that way every time we do a new episode it will show up in your feed every single time to follow up on the conversation we were just having i i, I think again um this is a good moment to bring this up and i'm glad you brought it up todd before we get to feedback friday and we're hoping to connect with steve baker from the courthouse at some point here um this this hour our colleague who is undergoing essentially a political persecution. There's just no other way to describe this. A straight up political persecution. This is what happened with Michael Flynn, with which Catherine Herridge at CBS News completely blew that up. And now they fired her, tried to take her sources. Now a judge is saying she has to name her sources or she's now she's being held in contempt for not doing so. The, the blaze has taken... A, a, a tremendous amount of risks here on multiple fronts. I mean, did you just even hear the promo that Jason Whitlock, our colleague, played uh, on his show? Without the Bible, without a biblical worldview, we don't have a chance. 
I mean, when you look across the landscape of even a lot of other major conservative networks, and there's other good people out there. I've got lots of friends, you know, that, that are not maybe not lots, but several that work at lots of these other places. There's not there's not a network that allows the freedom of thought, particularly when it comes to a biblical worldview and other things, from the host that is not just allowed, promoted, and publicized here, including yours truly. But what's really unique is what the Blaze has done with Steve Baker, allowing him to challenge the narrative of January 6th. And we've had Steve on this show at times where he has said, yeah, that person committed a crime on camera, should be charged. Right? We had those conversations too. He's not been one on here saying the whole thing, the everything was you know, a false flag. But that's not actually been his position. His position has always been from the beginning, let's just follow the evidence. And if bad people did bad stuff, they should be punished. And he's advocated for that. And if people did not do bad stuff, they shouldn't be punished. And if the stuff that people are claimed to have done is exaggerated, that should be exposed and punished. That's yeah. pretty much a summation of Steve's positions. Yeah, that's the opposite of a banana republic. Correct. That's what he's at calling for. And because of that, see, see, if Steve had done the opposite, I believe, if Steve had if Steve had been a caricature, everybody's a victim, nothing bad happened, nobody needed to be tear gassed. If he had done that, I don't think he'd be at a courthouse right now. Because at that point in time, he's a tool for the regime. He's helping them. They can play off of him. They can go to they can put their people on MSNBC and uh, see these nitwits show the obvious criminal acts that some did commit on that day, play off of that, that furthers their agenda. But see, he's not doing that. Steve's a truth guy. He's going to follow the truth wherever it leads. Folks, that's what they're afraid of more than anything else. Yep. Your zany counter narrative, they don't mind that at all. They love it, in fact. It gives them content. They'll play off of it. It's the truth that the darkness has always been afraid of. And that's why Steve is being persecuted as we speak. The Blaze took an amazing risk bringing him in. Took an amazing risk last year getting rid of Google ads. I mean, we have traffic in the tens of millions every month. You know how much revenue that is? Even though it's not what it used to be with censorship, it's still a significant amount of money. But we had to make a choice. And Tyler and Gaston, the people that run this place, made the choice that the truth was more important than that revenue. So they kicked it to the curb, rebranded the site, brought Matthew Peterson in, and went ad-free so we could do things like the investigative journalism you're seeing with Steve Baker. And now, now you're seeing the result of this. When we did the content that still got Google ads to give you a check, nobody was getting arrested for that. Weird. Almost like it's coordinated, right? Hey, if you, if you fit your content, even if it's critical within this acceptable window, we'll give you enough money to keep you doing that kind of content so you don't actually challenge our narratives. Funny how that works. I'm sure it's a coincidence, right? Yep. Right. The minute we kicked that to the curb and let people like Steve Baker do their jobs, all of a sudden now, the hammer falls. Or should we say the hammer and sickle? Not a coincidence. If you would like us to continue to do that kind of work, if we are not going to monetize off the spirit of the age, which is... Another way of saying Google AdSense. <laughs> if we're not going to monetize off of that. Or another way of saying Facebook distribution. If we're not going to monetize off of that, none of us can do this as a, for a living for nothing. Bidenflation hits some of us too, just like you. So if you want us to continue to do this kind of work, challenging of these narratives... Willingness to follow the truth. This is where we need support from you. So we have a code just for today I want to throw out. Theblaze.com slash truth. All right? Theblaze.com slash truth. That's where you can go to catch up on Steve Baker's reporting and support Blaze Media today. Theblaze.com slash truth. That, again, is theblaze.com slash truth. And we are hoping to connect with Steve Baker here uh, at some point this hour. Aaron, do you have any further updates since you and I last talked about Still this? Still nothing yet. We've we've shut down our live video unit. It's starting to run low on battery. There have been a f couple of fits and starts in this where we thought he was going to be out in a few minutes, but uh, 
This is the government's definition of in and out. Yeah, they're he originally pre- presented uh, presented sure. himself at seven o'clock this morning. It's five hours later. By the way, five hours. He's five hours. Let me tell you what it is that that they have charged him with. That he needed to be there for five hours today. All right. Here are the charges: entering restricted grounds, disorderly conduct, parading and picketing at the Capitol. This required shackles and chains, a dawn turn in. And five hours and counting a U.S. Marshal escort for these three misdemeanors and five hours and counting of whatever they're doing in there. By the way, this is another reason I don't give a damn who controls Ukraine. I don't care. My son's not fighting in any of your damn wars. When Putin or the shy comms or whoever, when they start landing troops on the homeland, Red Dawn style, we'll fight. Until then, you're on your own. I'm uh, No. I'm no fan of Vladimir Putin, but he didn't try to coercively poison me. This government did. He didn't throw Steve Baker. Or isn't trying to throw Steve Baker in jail. This government is. He didn't hold Catherine Herridge in contempt of court this morning. This government did. He didn't give a bunch of pro-lifers eleven year, a threat of 11 years in prison for praying on a sidewalk. This government did. So no, I don't give a runny turd about Ukraine. I don't care who controls it. I have no interest at all in the self-interest of either Vladimir Putin nor... World Economic Forum, Davos, George Soros, and their tentacles and acolytes. I don't care. If anything, if we're being, you know, a biblical worldview doesn't permit me to do this, but minus a biblical worldview, my position would probably be, I hope they fight each other to oblivion and blow themselves up. We'd all, the world be a better place without either. No. No. You wanted to otherize me? Your terms are acceptable. Let me say this before we get to Feedback Friday. I started doing something a few years ago, just as a hobby, really. And really, just to help me pass the time at night, getting ready for football season. You guys know I used to, I I discovered that you could find like basically whole seasons of old college football years. There's so many games on YouTube with the commercials, the live broadcast, you know, and I mentioned this before. I used to go on there and watch some of those games to pass the time. We're going to talk more about this on Pop Culture Tuesday, but here's a little preview. If you truly want to understand what Ronald Reagan meant when he said, we're always one generation from being the people that had to, to warn our children about what America was like when, it, when we were once free. Or when I say things like, when a culture lets go of the rope, it goes fast. If you want to, you want to get a fairly easy and accessible understanding of this, and we'll go into more detail about it on Tuesday. Go on YouTube, find live sporting events from the 1980s that are on there. I watched the 1980 gold medal, or it wasn't the gold medal game, the game that led to the gold medal, the U.S. over the Soviets. Man, even knowing how it ends, the last two minutes of Al Michaels calls, just thinking about it again, man, (laughs) just gave me a shiver, okay? You want to see... How far and and so we're going in the eighties. What's that? Forty years? Mm. Biblically, that would be what? A generation. generation. Yeah. Look, go watch. Go just get some time this weekend, late at night. Go on YouTube. Start looking for actual broadcast of nineteen eighty sporting events. Pick any sport: NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, college football, basketball. They're all there. Pick any sport. It is an entirely different 
would you say the other day on the show, Aaron, I went off this timeline? Yeah. That, that's another timeline. That's another dimension. It's like an entirely different country. And I'll bet if in the if they had this in the 80s and you went back and watched ads in the 40s, or probably back then you had to listen to them, aside from the technology, the value system really wouldn't be that much different. The ling- There'd be you know different lingo and stuff, but the value system wouldn't be that much different. This, this is another earth. I mean, this, this, this will blow your mind. And you will be like, what? this country once existed. This place happened once. This occurred. And hey, man, it had its problems, had its issues. We had latchkey kids. They dealt with, you know, they, they, were, they dealt with pornography and everything else. Amy was listening to a Billy Graham sermon from 1985 where he was talking about a Time Magazine um, survey from 1945 on the, uh, the biggest challenges teachers faced in schools. And it was chewing gum and talking during class. And in 1985, they were like, you know, fighting, threats, okay? Can you imagine if we did 1985 to 2025 what it would be? I mean... I- one generation, man. One. And that's all it ever takes. Again, we'll talk more about that on Tuesday. You guys ready for some Feedback, feedback Friday? Let's go. As we await Steve Baker. Any minute now. Any is moment. It, is it any moment now? Yeah. Then let me get this one in quickly. Um, Michael Forsyth wrote me a note. I won't even read it. Because it's it's any minute now. Asking me what I know about Preston Sprinkle. And he's at a church where they're considering bringing him in. Run. First, run to your pastor. Confront him. And then, if your pastor's like, yeah, we're canceling that. It, it, it doesn't like cancel that. Run away from that church. Preston Sprinkle is the next Rob Bell. Do your own research. Basically, his entire shtick is, did God really say, especially now, it, especially on which issue do you think it is that he's, he's, he's asking if these are, this is really what the Bible has to say. You can guess. Gender, homosexuality. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like that, yeah. yeah, that stuff. Run, run, run. Yeah, Preston Sprinkle is a, a, he's a wannabe Rob Bell. You don't want any part of that. Don't let that camel's nose in under the tent at all. Don't let it in. All right, do we go ahead? Sounds like a character in the Left Behind books. It's real. Well, even the name is Preston Sprinkle. I know. Right? Was there a church father wrote a great work? His name was Preston Sprinkle. No. No. All right, do we have our colleague Steve Baker? One more moment. Looks like it looked like he was good to go for a bit, but uh, I think we've got him. Steve, can you hear us? I got you, Steve. All right. Hey, thank you, brother. Can Let you me, hear me? Uh, we, we have you. You have us okay? You're hearing and seeing us okay? Good. Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, I got you. So our colleague Steve Baker I is here you. just out of the uh, the courthouse, the federal courthouse there in Dallas. Steve, let me let me just start with a dumb question, but uh, we're buds, so it's a personal question. How are you doing, man? Um, I'm a little humiliated, but I'm okay. What went on there for the last, what, five hours? Yeah, well, starting at 7 o'clock this morning, um, they took me in, they processed me, put me in cuffs. Uh, that was the FBI. And then they put me in a car in cuffs and drove me to the courthouse, handed me over to the U.S. Marshals, who then uh, put me in leg chains. Uh, the, only, the only thing I, that didn't happen that I was expecting was um, uh, an orange jumpsuit. Uh, you know, all I had to do was surrender my necktie and my belt and my shoelaces, and otherwise I was able to wear my clothes. Uh, but I did get to um, uh, sport some leg chains for several hours. I've not had a chance to read um, the charges, but to, uh, looking at uh, our uh, mutual friend and colleague Sarah Gonzalez's feed, 
It appears that they're charging you with entering yep. restricted grounds, disorderly conduct, parading and picketing in the Capitol. Is that accurate? Are those the charges they gave you this morning? Yeah, th those are the charges. <laughs> it is, is my behavior, or is that accurate? Was that my behavior? No. And, of course, we have the video to prove that. I assume you com were you able to communicate that to them, either yourself or your attorney, during the five hours you were you were uh, no. there this morning? No, that, that wasn't the purpose of this hearing today. This was just for me to accept the charges, to uh, agree to all of the circumstances and the restrictions uh, that are, uh, I'm faced with going forward and making sure that I just understand the law and how it, how it uh, pertains to this situation. And obviously, uh, I'm, I'm essentially on probation right now while I'm not being detained. So anything I do can be used against me in a court of law, as they say. Um, fortunately, I don't have a gag order on me. Uh, that was also, my I next question. I have a restricted uh, travel. Yeah, I don't have restricted travel to D.C., which is highly unusual because that's uh, that's what they do to 100 percent of the january 6th uh, defendants as they restrict their travel to dc but they did not and i think that they didn't want that battle uh i think they know that because that's where i do most of my work that this was something that they didn't want to um, you know take a, a pr bloody nose on i saw our editor matthew peterson share on uh, x or twitter about an hour ago that the blaze is poised to release footage that directly um, contradicts the charges against you. Did I, did I see that correctly? You did see that correctly. You know, this is, this is the, the tough part, and this is one of the things that's really difficult for anybody to understand unless they're following these trials and these cases, is that the charging documents and what they call the statements of facts are presented as a narrative from the government side, and it's usually five, six, ten times worse than actually what the behavior of the defendant was, whether it was a misdemeanor or a felony. I mean, obviously, if you were swinging a baseball uh, bat at a cop, you, you know, whatever else they said doesn't matter. But if you're a person, like, like for instance, they're, they're saying that I picketed and I paraded through the Capitol. Well, that did not happen. Uh, they said that I was disruptive and in, in in using abusive language. That did not happen. The only thing that they say in the statement of facts is what they have done to all of these. Uh, and I think I've even told you this before, is all of these trials are about scary words. All of this is about the suppression of speech and, and, and basically teaching those of us on the right side of the political spectrum what we can and cannot say and what is allowed and so they are literally in the charging documents using words that i said before or after against me not my behavior inside the capitol words after you mean like editorial or political commentary they're using that against you is that what you're alluding to absolutely 100 percent wow i you never think this is a, stuff's going to happen to you. Exactly. No, no, you don't. And and this is this is the message that they're trying to send is that this can happen to any of us. Mm -hmm. If we don't say the right things, if we don't restrict our speech, if we don't limit our speech in the manner in which they um, uh, dictate, then this can happen to you just as it's happening to me right now. Steve, what was it like sitting in there? And, you know, you're sitting there in Dallas, Texas, you're in the heart of Texas, a place that a lot of people think is kind of the one of the last outpost Valhalla's of Americana. And you're sitting there knowing that knowing that we are sitting on this footage that would exonerate you against their charges. And you're looking at people that go to the same McDonald's you do. You know, the same Chick-fil-A you do, the same movie theater you do, you know, drive the same streets you do, root for the same ball clubs you do. And you're looking at them, but but they're treating you like you are another, like you are um, you are worthy of you're not there is no e pluribus unum here. It dies at the door. Right. I mean, sitting there for five hours looking around at your fellow countrymen. And, and, and just looking at their countenances and, and their behavior as they're doing this to you. What was that like? What crossed your mind? Yeah. 
All, all of this has crossed my mind in the last five hours. I mean, especially, especially after I had the opportunity to read the charging documents myself and to see what was going to be said, because see, I know how this works. I've, I've read hundreds of these J6 uh, charging documents, and I know from experience how over, overly exaggerated they are, how distorted the narrative is from the government on these charging documents. But the problem is, is half of the country doesn't care. The other half are influenced by it still. I mean, it's going to color the way they think about somebody that has those types of things said about them. Uh, true or untrue, um, colored, uncolored, exaggerated or not, people are, are still going to believe uh, a, a modicum even of that and think about you differently. So yeah, those, you know, I, w I walked out of the building today uh, and, you know, Matt looked at me and asked me how I was. I said, I'm more worried about how you are than I am. <laughs> you know, how do you feel right now? What's this been like on a personal level for your family? Just your daily life, you've had this sort of Damocles uh, over you for yeah. months now, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, two and a half years. And so uh, my, my kids are good, you know. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you ask me what it's like to, you know, to, to, to go out into the world, the Chick-fil-A's, and, 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 and have the perception of other people and wondering what it was about you. There's only two people on this planet that I care about what they think about me, and it's the two people that I brought into this world, and my son and my daughter are proud of me and they're behind me it goes for all of us here as well steve god bless you brother and uh we got your back you let us know or our audience know whatever we can do you whatever they can do do not hesitate to ask okay thank you steve really appreciate that you got it man god bless gentlemen thoughts on that conversation well uh just him coming out and seeing Matthew Peterson and asking in return how he is. Uh, I mean, that's just a, wow. Just on a, a basic guy level, amazing. But there's more in there than that because th this is, you th we are in 2024. And not only is this something that we need to view as just still going on, Make no mistake, this is raising the stakes. They want a bigger fight. As he said, they can do it to all of us. Oh, you know, proud boys, things you never heard of. None of those, a lot of the people in prison with no due process, uh, certainly did, even if they are guilty of something, have in no way deserved what they've uh, happened to them. But so far... They've gotten away with it. And as we saw with COVID, they always want more. They are always greedy for more. How do you raise the stakes on that? You come after the blaze. Everybody, look around you. It's all of our partners in crime that do this, Daily Wire, Fox News to some extent, either you get damn serious that this is about way more than just clicks and all of that nonsense. Lives, fortune, sacred honor time. Right now. Are you in or aren't you? That's it. Thank you, Steve Baker, for showing us what real steadfastness, real principles, real courage looks like. And by extension, once again, all the people at The Blaze who are sick and tired of being sick and tired and to the degree that we plan on rewriting the rules on how we're going to deal with this nonsense, I'm in, man. I am in. I read the full complaint in the in the last 20 minutes or so, and what he said is basically this is not really about his actions inside the Capitol. It's about it's about speech before and after the events at the Capitol. And I have to say that his his summation is correct. This I read the complaint. It's not a legal argument. It's not a argument about laws whatsoever. It's an emotional argument meant for meant for one audience, the kangaroo court in DC to pull at their, oh man, he's one of those MAGA type. There's nothing, the, the, the argument in my estimation that the FBI is making against him is just, he said icky things. So throw him in prison. It's worked so far. It was he given worked. the option of death or walking the uh, ice, uh, uh, ice uh, river in Gotham there by uh, the Scarecrow? And I'll just, yeah, sold to the man in the cold sweat. Yes. Uh, 
that video that's circulating this morning. Capturing in full high definition, maybe even 4K, that I think some of our videographers at The Blaze shot. Maybe it was Brianna Morella, an independent journalist. But seeing him led by the FBI agents when he first turned himself in, in handcuffs. I don't know if he was shackled at that point or not. I think he was. If that doesn't permeate this country and send a chill throughout this country, what's left of this country, uh, what's left of the people who actually give a damn, we're toast. We're toast based on what I just read in this complaint. Maybe we already are. Maybe this is another indication that we already are. But man alive, um, hats off to Steve. That has to be a, a harrowing experience. Going up, you're basically, it's one guy in a chair against the full might and power of what might still be the most powerful entity on the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. And having your, having your well-being, having your livelihood just bandied about in front of you, that's terrifying. It's terrifying. So thoughts um, and definitely still be praying for Steve, his attorneys, uh, throughout this process, because this is, this is tyranny. This is evil. How much of it are we going to just let go? I had a conversation with a buddy of mine about all this this morning. And uh, you know me, I, I tend to... I, I tend to contextualize things either biblically, historically, or pop culture. One of those three, you know. And um, there, was a, there was a pop culture reference made in our conversation that I think is very applicable here. And it, it kind of ties back in again to how things can radically change in a culture in just one generation, just one. But I'm up against the clock. I don't have time to get to it right now. But I'll give you a tease. Um, if you remember the book about the rise of the Clintons, Primary Colors, and the movie that was made based on it, which isn't bad. The book's way better. But... There's a culminating moment at the end of this tale that I think applies perfectly here to explain what has occurred. And I want to I wanna touch on that when we return. Stay tuned. I know a lot of times we feel helpless. What can we do? Here's one simple thing that uh, that all of us can do. Go to daceforhillsdale.com. That's daceforhillsdale.com. Uh, you can get a free pocket constitution there, but you can also check out the Constitution Minute broadcast that Hillsdale is preparing. Just trying to come up with a way uh, to reach uh, the next generation because uh, 18 to 30 year old Americans are the least likely to revere the founding fathers, uh, understand the history of the country, the processes uh, by which the country was founded and the principles it was founded upon. Uh, they are the, by in mass, they are by and large uh, proof that uh, our people perish for lack of knowledge, as the prophet once said. So if you want to hear one of these Constitution Minutes, and if you like it, hopefully share it with a young person you know. Go to daceforhillsdale.com. Again, daceforhillsdale.com. Again, that is daceforhillsdale.com. Um, if you guys don't mind, I, I kind of want to park it here with what's happening with Steve Baker. Yeah. And I'm sure... Um, there's some really good feedback out there we'll get to on another day. It would just, they'd all be awkward segues, and I don't want to do that to you guys. You guys took the, the, the time and energy to write into the show, and, it, and, and we selected it to be on the air. It deserves to get the hearing that you wanted it to have. Okay, like I, I think about the one I read there at the top of the hour about Preston Sprinkle. I would have liked to explore that more, but I'm just telling you, if your church entertains Preston Sprinkle, do not entertain it yourself. Don't. Do your own research, though. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a bishop. I have no ecclesiastical authority. I'm just a pretty well-informed layman. Don't go anywhere near that. But do your own research. Come up with your own opinion. I want to talk about what I teased at the uh, end of the last segment. 
and, and just how things can change in a generation. And if you've never read Primary po- uh, Colors, it is a phenomenal book. One of the best political books I've ever read in my life. And the, uh, the story was told, I can't remember the reporter who was embedded with the Clintons, but a corporate left a liberal media reporter. And he, he just wrote about the things that he saw and heard embedded with the Clinton campaign in 1991 and 92 and put it all in. He kind of Sir Thomas More utopia it, you know, um, it was pretty clear who he was writing about and who these people are. But since he didn't name actual names, you know, I was hoping it wasn't going to get back to him, basically. And they made a movie about it uh, starring John Travolta as uh, Bill Clinton. And the movie is very good. The book is outstanding. And the character that I want to talk about is the character that Kathy Bates plays in the movie. So one of, one of the things that you, that you learn in this story is that uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton met uh, one of their best friends from university. Uh, was one of the first sort of outed um, lesbian activists in the Democratic Party. And they went to college together, and they were close and friends. And she was kind of the uh, the, the hard ass of their triumvirate. So Bill was the, um, uh, he was the, the, the pitch man, okay, the front man, all right. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton is setting the agenda, Right. So she's on lead guitar. OK. And Kathy Bates, her character, the lesbian woman, is the drummer. Right. OK. And uh, and her one of the things that she would do is get oppo research on who they were going against so they could exploit it against them. At the end of the story, um, she is over the course of this book, she is becoming increasingly disillusioned with the Clintons. They have been friends for over 20 years, but, but the run for the presidency is bringing out a level of soulless ruthlessness in them that, that she is concerned they're losing, you know, they're, they're losing their souls in this process. And they really believed they were the morally superior people. You can see this when you read both the book and see the movie that the, the Nixonian Republicans were clearly, um, uniquely corrupt, meaning that it wasn't just the trappings of political office and the desire to retain power that can engulf any of us with Lord Acton's, you know, axiom that, you know, absolute power corrupts, right? It, that, that no, the, the, these Republicans were uniquely corrupted. There was something, they were a, a, something wrong with them on a human level that actually made them more corrupting then they were being corrupted. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so they really believed this about themselves or as Barack Obama, you know, we used to say it during the Barack Obama years, he, these people really believe they're the people we've been waiting on, waiting for. Okay. They, and you can see this in both the book and the film. They really believed in the moral superiority of themselves or as Paul would say, a law unto themselves. And so they, they send Kathy Bates's character on an excursion to get this key piece of, um, oppo research and I believe it's to be used to drive Paul Songus if I remember the story right yeah I think it's that's to right. drive Paul Songus out of the race and in the movie he's played by Harry Larry Hagman by the way it's to drive him out of the race if I'm remember, remembering the story right yeah okay and Bates thinks Bates's character thinks this goes too far but she decides she's going to test the Clintons she's she's going to put them their their integrity to the test and so she wrestles with whether to give them the oppo research that she has or not. She decides to give it to them. But not because she wants them to use it, but because she does not. And she tells them that if memory serves. Yeah, right? Eventually. Eventually, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, but not up front. <laughs> yeah. And she's hoping that they really are the hippie, higher enlightened, superior, morally superior human that they convinced themselves they were in the 60s. She gives them the oppo. They use it. Ruthlessly. Just like Richard Nixon would. Just like those Nixonian Republicans would. And that's essentially Kathy Bates' sell point. She dips. She's out. 
And there's this great scene, the way it's portrayed in the book is great too, but this is one of the best scenes in the film, actually, where Bates essentially ejects, and you would think it would cause this like heartbreaking moment, and for a minute it does, right? These people have been friends, inseparable for literally decades. But once she ejects, Hillary and Bill, man, turn the page fast, like in a nanosecond, and get right to planning out their next maneuver. And what's going to, how, how to win now that they're going to be the nominee. And this is a more contemporary application of the ending of Orwell's Animal Farm. And they looked from pig to man and man to pig and back to pig again. And they couldn't tell which was which. They couldn't tell the difference. If you're a boomer in this country, you're old enough to remember things like Daniel, the, the Pentagon Papers, Alexander Butterfield talking about bugging offices. You remember these things. You lived through them. You're living through them again. And the parting on the left is now the parting on the right, and their beards have all grown longer overnight. For we know that the hypnotized never lie. In my opinion, that's the greatest rock song ever done. Won't get fooled again by the who. You know, the, the backstory of that song, by the way, is that coming out of Woodstock, again, they really believed in their own moral superiority. We are the generation, the, the enlightened ones. These hippie boomers really believe this. They're the better people. And so coming out of Woodstock and the Summer of Love and that era, uh, uh, Pete Townsend took part in a commune, I believe it was, in the Soho District of London, I think it was. And they were all going to live there in peace. They were going to live John Lennon's Imagine. What do you think happened? Same thing that a uh, version of which happened to the pilgrims, actually. Yeah, human nature happens. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Bible is not an old book that tells us what happened. It's an eternal book that tells us what always happens. Human nature happened. No covenant of marriage. People start cheating on each other. People then turn on each other. No meritocracy. Stuff doesn't get done. No incentive to work. In other words, what you mentioned, I mean, that, they, they hadn't reached the adultery stage yet, but the pilgrim husbands were resentful that the young husbands were resentful that their wives were going and helping elderly sick men on the boat and not being at home. And they were like the word of God believers. What do you think would happen in the Soho yeah. district of London amongst the hippie druggies? What was going on there? It was... It was depravity. Total depravity is what happened. And Townsend walked out of that experience so disillusioned. That's that's what the song Won't Get Fooled Again is about. It's a realization. Holy bleep. We're not any better than our parents were. We're not any smarter. We're not any more enlightened. We're not any more righteous. Now, the song has the right premise but the wrong conclusion it, it it essentially just leaves you in a state of cynicism but this is what happens when we look in and we don't look up with steve baker and uh, uh and and too many boomer grandparents who'd never got their lives back. Ashley Babbitt, whose life was, t life was taken. What, what, what they are victims of is the, is, is the one generation matrix working itself out. This all started with, we're the people that believe in the common man. We're the people that distrust the corporations. We're the people that believe in justice and transparency and freedom of speech and are against censorship. Another great example of this is James Woods. 
He started off way over here on the left, believing these talking points. Now, as he gets into the twilight of his life, he's way over here on the right. Because like Pete Townsend, he tested his own talking points. You know what he found? They were horse pucky. Total BS. Topic three on our day group. What was it titled last hour? Old magic. old magic. We can't outrun the old magic. We try. We try. Almost every generation somewhere in the world tries it. And this is the reason why I'm pretty hard on the boomers collectively as a generation on this show, because they were the first generation in this country that tried it. And we're still suffering from those decisions. We cannot outrun the old magic. We're not basically good. We're not a perfectible being that just hasn't found the perfectible process to finish off our perfection yet. We're sinners. We will turn on each other. We will violate each other. We will betray each other. Unless there are certain recognitions of those behaviors embedded into a societal structure that will de incent it. Now, you won't ever eliminate it totally. Human nature finds a way. But, but you have to create a society that has de incentivization structures so that these things don't become systemic. And what happened is the counterculture hippie boomer generation eradicated all of those de incentivization structures. Well, something's got to something's got to be in there. It can't have nothing. Something has to replace it. So it was replaced with Antonio Gramsci's long march through the institutions. Those institutions, by the way, are still de-incentivizing things. But here's what they're de-incentivizing now. Free speech, free press, freedom of thought. God-given rights. That's, that makes you a Christian nationalist, by the way. And this all happened in one generation. A generation that started off thinking, we're not going to make the same mistakes as those, that older generation. And by believing that, by believing in the superiority of themselves, they made far worse mistakes than the previous generations did. As I listen to Aaron describe what it was like reading Steve Baker's complaint, it reminded me of what I said yesterday as I was, dis as I was discussing the complaint against Trump in the Supreme Court. What you described, Aaron is not a legal proceeding with the intent of generating a political outcome. But a political proceeding designed to generate a legal outcome to give these judges expressed permission yes. to do what's in their hearts and they want to do anyway. That's what it is. If it was legal, as you pointed out during the break when we were talking about this, Aaron, they would have said, on, and on this date, at this time, Steve Baker walked into here and did this wrong. They, th th that's not in there. He said these things. He said mean things. You know what this reads like? What you're describing? I've not had a chance to read it. This reads very much like the Colorado State Supreme Court uh, brief. Well, we took Trump off the ballot because we just don't like him. Yeah. Which is why it was never going to stop at just the people who are affiliated with people you've never heard of, Proud Boys, things like that. They're going to pick off and they're going to increasingly raise the stakes, just like you pointed out with Trump. Do you think they're going to just say, you know, I think we don't, we can't squeeze it in. We're running out of time. No, they're going to get it in, all of it, unless we radically alter our approach to this whole thing. So what's, what is something on the granular level we can do? Well, let me give you an option. If you are in the Nashville area or you can get there, Jason Whitlock is holding the Fearless Army roll call uh, coming up soon. You can register for this at fearlessarmyrollcall.com. It's Fearless Army Roll Call 2.0 is the name of the event, second annual. What's the goal? Um, it's an all-day event, June 1st, to bring men together and to call them to be men, to fulfill their God-given destiny and equip them along those lines. Because ultimately, we are not a nation of laws and we never have been. We're a nation of political will and we always will be. And unfortunately, too many men lack the will on our side to fulfill that. 
So the people that don't know what a man is, or if they do, hate it, we're acting and living under their will instead. So again, if you want to register for this, you can reserve your spot today. FearlessArmyRollCall.com, sponsored by Preborn, by the way. FearlessArmyRollCall.com. Aaron, you have a final thought here in the last minute before we go? <sighs> Gird your loins as a man. That's, that's my thoughts. We're facing some days ahead that will be dark, no doubt. So get ready. Get busy living or get busy dying. Mm-hmm. Being a man is not a leisure pursuit. For such a time as this, though, you're not here by accident either, but for this. Romans 8, 28.